Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Charles Seif presenting his new book, Hawking Hawking, The Selling of the Scientific Celebrity. Tonight's event is a part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now far beyond. Be on the lookout for more virtual science book talks coming up this September, including with Adam Kucharski on September 13th for his new very timely book, The Rules of Contagion, Why Things Spread and Why They Stop. To learn more about our series, visit the webpage harvard.com slash science, or you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. Uh, we also have a YouTube page where you can watch any previous talks, recordings that you might have missed. I will be posting links to those in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes. Tonight's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A button up on your screen where you can submit your question. And we're going to get through as many as time allows for. This event also has closed captioning available. So depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you might need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption or CC button on your screen. Um, and I'd also like to say a tremendous thank you as always for your patronage during these strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and it ensures the future of a landmark local independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thanks to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors for indie book selling and especially for science. Uh, finally, as you know, with virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm going to do my best to resolve it quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Charles Seif is professor of journalism at New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. He's the author of numerous science and mathematics books, including Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea, Virtual Unreality, Proofiness, Sun in a Bottle, Decoding the Universe, and Alpha and Omega. He's written for Science, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and New Scientist Magazine, continuing to freelance today. And beyond this prolific three-decade career, Charles has also served as a television documentary writer and as a BBC scientific consultant. This evening, he'll be speaking about his latest book, Hawking Hawking, celebrated by Science Magazine as the best biography yet published of the most famous scientist of recent decades. Further, the New York Review of Books writes of Hawking Hawking, Scythe aims to find the human lost inside the myth, so he must first chip away a gaudy shell. The metamorphosis at the book's heart is when it comes dramatic. We're so pleased to host him for tonight's fascinating event. So without further ado, Charles, the digital podium is now yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen to, uh, to have a few graphics and videos. Um, but thank you. I really appreciate uh, being invited to give this talk. And I, I love talking about the physics and uh, the, the celebrity of Stephen Hawking. Um, because these two things are uh, intertwined in unexpected ways. And this is what inspired me to write this book uh, about Stephen Hawking. So what typically comes to mind for people when they think of Stephen Hawking is uh, this sort of image. Um, the idea of a brilliant physicist who worked on the theory of everything, but used a wheelchair to get around uh, because of a disease, uh, ALS, which claimed his ability to walk, as well as um, his ability to speak. He spoke through a computer. Um, he, he's also thought of as a best-selling author, uh, the author of the most famous work of popular science of the 20th century. He's also a Simpsons character. Uh, let me play a little clip for you. You should all do what I say. My IQ is 199 for crying out loud. 198, 197. Big deal. My IQ is 280. <gasps> Stephen Hawking, the world's smartest man. 
the world's smartest man. That's the image, anyhow. Um, reality is a lot more complicated, and I'll take you backwards in time a little bit to peel back the image and to get to the real person underneath. The reality is that Hawking was absolutely a top class physicist, but he himself rejected comparisons to Newton and Einstein. And there were and are many contemporary physicists, including some in your local area, Cambridge, um, who are of equal and greater importance and talent. He didn't actually work on a theory of everything. His research was on the black holes and the Big Bang, which are also interesting, but it's not uh, the theory of everything that everyone seems to think. And he also did write one of the most uh, best-selling books, uh, science books of all time. But at the same time, he had extreme difficulty communicating, more so almost than any other human being on the planet. So how did this image of Stephen Hawking, the talented science communicator, the world's smartest man, the next Newton and Einstein evolve? Um, that's part of what was interesting and got me into the writing this book. And it turns out that this image was carefully cultivated. And this leads to one of the biggest ironies of his life. And Hawking prided himself on his modesty and objectivity. And he always actively distanced himself from the false image of him as a new Newton or another Einstein. And every time there's an interview with him asking him that, uh, about that, he will always say, no, 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 I'm not in the same class. Yet, at the same time, he and his family carefully cultivated that image uh, because it was important to his fame, central to his fame, and to his income, to his wealth. And here's an example of if you visit Westminster Abbey, Abbey, you can see his gravestone, uh, which is mere steps away from those of Charles Darwin and Isaac Newton. Uh, and here is his gravestone. Here lies uh, what was mortal of Stephen Hawking. It's a conscious emulation of the epitaph of Isaac Newton, which again is just a few yards away. In Latin, it says, here lies what was mortal of Isaac Newton. That's not a coincidence. The Hawking Foundation, which still exists, uh, is, um, makes money in his name, selling strange things sometimes. Um, you've got uh, books and scented candles and other memorabilia, and it continues after his death. And he also signed an exclusive, uh, the, the uh, foundation signed an exclusive contract with a biographer uh, to write his official biography, which is quite possibly going to be, uh, I suspect it will be very different from the one that I wrote because it is going to be uh, helping with the image that he so carefully cultivated. I'm not interested in writing hagiographies and I'm, not also, I'm also not interested in being under the control of Hawking's family, especially since control by the family and the exploitation of the Hawking name is a very important leitmotif in the last stage of Hawking's life. Here, for example, is, oops, uh, is a children's book, one of a series written by his daughter. And as far as I can tell, it's the only time that he surrendered uh, place of uh, the first place as an author <laughs> uh, willingly um, on a book. Um, and so, the series was very much trading on the Hawking name, but it was written, he had very little uh, involvement with the book itself. And it's not just the family who are making money off of Hawking's name and using him for their purposes. Uh, Multi-millionaires and billionaires have a long history of cultivating not just Hawking, but theoretical physicists in general. Uh, Werner Erhardt, um, who uh, created the EST, uh, Foundation Est, uh, which you might know of in the, had a kind of almost cult-like presence in the 1970s, um, had a very long-standing arrangement with physicists. Um, and Hawking actually participated in these Est-sponsored seminars a little bit. 
um, much more substantial was his um, interaction with Peter Diamandis, who is a satellite mogul. He's the one who um, arranged Hawking's famous zero gravity flight, where a airplane goes up in a parabolic trajectory and you get a few seconds of zero gravity as it uh, goes on that trajectory. Um, he was a great photo op. Um, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars, which was all um, paid for by Diamandis for a reason um, having to do with a contract at NASA that he was going for, I believe. Um, so uh, he was, Hawking's photo op uh, was useful to this uh, billionaire. Uh, Richard Branson also used Hawking. Branson, as you know, recently uh, started launching people into space. And uh, over a decade ago, um, uh, not over a decade ago, uh, uh, about a decade ago, um, uh, he had a accident on one of his test flights and it killed uh, one of the pilots and really uh, the, because the test crafts failed and everyone was worried about the safety of these craft, it knocked his um, business back uh, on its feet for a number of years. And so um, he, at the time when he did the accident investigation, wanted to build back confidence in his spacecraft. And so that's when he called in Hawking. He called Hawking in specifically um, to tell people not to be afraid of the risks of space flight. And um, they used, uh, uh, Branson invited Hawking to visit um, uh, Virgin and put the, an image of the iris of his eye on the side of the spacecraft. And Branson also promised that Hawking would be one of the first passengers into space. He gave him a free ticket, uh, which Hawking unfortunately was never able to cash. Um, and so Hawking was very explicitly used to tell people, don't worry, uh, this is safe. And I'll play a little clip, um, which was used. I have had ALS for over 50 years now, and while I have no fear of adventure, others do not always take the same view. Fortunately, I have found a kindred spirit in Richard Branson. Yes, I, I, I there's pretty clear. I, I, I suspect that Hawking didn't really uh, find Richard Branson truly a kindred spirit, uh, but their relationship definitely benefited each other. Um, Hawking also had a very close relationship with um, George Mitchell, who's a lesser known billionaire, but he was um, uh, instrumental in the development of fracking and he had a big uh, state out in Texas, which Hawking used to go to re uh, regularly. Uh, Yuri Milner, a Russian oligarch, um, also had a close relationship with him and uh, used him to promote some of his scientific schemes. And yes, he was actually um, spotted on Jeffrey Epstein's uh, private island. Um, I have no evidence that there was any uh, interaction with Hawking, between Hawking and Epstein uh, beyond just this one visit to the island. If there was something more, though, it wouldn't have surprised people, uh, given that Hawking actually had a predilection for swingers clubs and sex clubs, which became public at, towards the end of his life. This was actually an interesting part of his life, and I won't go into it here, uh, beyond saying that I think he got the habit from a time that he spent in Caltech in the 1970s, uh, and the culture at Caltech was, um, let's say, easygoing, especially in, uh, including some of the best physicists in the world, like uh, Richard Feynman, uh, whom he met uh, during the sabbatical year. Uh, Feynman himself uh, had a predilection for strip clubs and, in fact, wound up as an expert witness in a local case about um, strip clubs. Um, I doubt that this sort of stuff is going to wind up in a, an official biography, uh, but I think that um, it's important to understanding him. And I, I think that another thing that's really important to understanding him is the degree of control that was exerted over him by his family, especially his second wife, which is a very interesting relationship. 
Um, there is an allegation, and this is his second wife, Elaine. Um, and I do believe that at least some of the allegations are true, um, that she was abusive towards him. Remember, Hawking was almost completely paralyzed uh, by his disease, especially it got worse and worse as he got older. One story that I got from several sources uh, was that she would punish him by taking the controller to his computer out of his hand, uh, leaving him completely helpless and walk away. He was unable to reach over and grab that controller back. So if this was true, it was a really horrible allegation. There were also allegations against one of his nurses, allegations that were very unusually kept secret from the public. Uh, most of these sorts of allegations in Britain were have public hearings. These were privatized and I was unable to get to the bottom of it. I have some theories, but uh, due to various uh, libel laws and uh, I was unable to really uh, get too much into that. Um, but there were some very interesting questions around that. His relationships um, often also led to money woes. Um, the money woes, and I've, uh, this is actually a FOIA that I um, tried to get some of these documents uh, and failed. Um, his money woes, uh, despite the fact that he had enormous income from Brief History of Time and his other books, he had enormous expenses because of his disease. And he had, he had round the clock nursing, much of which was not paid for by national health services in England. Um, so uh, these money woes were part of the reason that Hawking at the, towards the end of his life would lend his name to a number of endeavors that one would have thought were beneath him. Like this ad for a gambling website. Pricing data since the 66 World Cup. I have answered two of the biggest questions tormenting fans. One, what are the optimal conditions for England's success? And two, how do you score in a penalty shootout? The technique I have used is called general logistic regression modeling. Our chance of triumph can be worked out by looking at a number of variables. Statistically, England's red kid is more successful. Obviously, he didn't do any modeling here. And even if he did, it's garbage. The idea that England's wearing red clothing increases their chance of victory is really uh, questionable. Um, uh, truth be told, though, Hawking uh, was more than happy to lend his voice to people so long as it, uh, he could, it would make him money or increase his fame. And when I say lend his voice, I mean it quite literally. This is a snippet of an interview I had with uh, director Errol Morris. Errol Morris uh, directed the Brief History of Time movie. Okay, thank you. I had changed some of the voiceover because we had the voice synthesizer and theoretically I could have Hawking saying anything. You just type in a sentence and the voice synthesizer speaks the sentence and you record it and you put it in the movie. Um, and I had changed something. It was from one of his public lectures. And he noticed it immediately. And he said, you changed that. And then he said, but I like it better. This is quite remarkable. The idea that you could actually put words in someone's mouth and it would be undis indistinguishable from if it were the person himself speaking. This is the, really the only person on the planet you could do this with uh, reliably. Um, and by the end of his life, Hawking was starring in a TV series or another every couple of years. And he wouldn't have to do anything but sit in his chair and the videographer would take a number of shots, often a long spiral shot around him in his wheelchair, a close up of his eye, a close up of him clicking on his um, computer. Um, and the director, 
who had been given the use of Hawking's voice box as synthesizer would superimpose whatever audio he wanted upon the scene. For one show that I analyzed, the entire season of six one hour shows has a grand total of four minutes of unique footage of Hawking. So an entire season, six one hour show, four minutes of Hawking mixed and remixed and reversed and color altered with different voice superimpositions that Hawking would show up for an hour and he would be done and everything else would be taken care of. Hawking would also lend his name to poorly written books. For example, this one, which was patch written, um, which is taking uh, uh, poorly digested stuff of bordering on plagiarism or arguably outright plagiarized. So this is a um, biography of Descartes um, that uh, this is from his book, um, which was a compilation, um, God Created the Integers. And this is from a biography of uh, Descartes, uh, which was published a few years earlier. And there are pretty clear signs that this was the source and it wasn't properly, um, there, there, there was no uh, indication that he took this from this uh, biography. You can tell that it's kind of poorly digested that instead of tobacco flavored with wine, you've got wine flavored tobacco. There's little errors throughout that show really just um, very poorly um, written, poorly digested, almost plagiaristic writing. Uh, here. And that's, this occurs a number of times in a few of the books. Um, and unfortunately for Hawking, he would make only a fraction of what his name was worth. Um, there were people who were always trying to uh, exploit the Hawking name and not give him his fair share. Here is a complaint to the Federal Trade Commission that I dug up. Um, where Hawking was complaining that he was being exploited by a publisher. So Hawking was able to make money off his name, but lots more people were able to use him uh, and benefit arguably even more than he was. So this uh, discussion at the end of his life and the exploitation is sad, but the question is, it raises the question, how did he become famous in the first place? How did he get his reputation? And this leads us to the second big irony in Hawking's life. And he was insistent that he would not be treated any differently because of his disease, because of his uh, ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, he really wanted to be thought of as a physicist who happened to be, uh, maybe if you thought about it, happened to have this disease, but he wanted to be a physicist and a human being first and someone with a disability far, far second. However, his fame and fortune depended to a large extent on the fact that the ALS made him different. And he was acutely aware of this. So a quick timeline. Um, of kind of the core of his rise to fame. In 1974, he was elected to the Royal Society and he appeared in a documentary, The Key to the Universe in 1977. Um, he wound up becoming the Lucasian professorship, uh, the Lucasian professor in 1979, which is the same office that Newton held, which cemented this kind of successor to Newton idea. Uh, he got a number of protile, uh, profiles in high uh, profile places and started writing a brief history of time. In 1985, he had a tracheostomy, which caused him to lose his voice, and he got his robotic voice soon after. The publication of A Brief History of Time was published in, uh, it was in 1988, and there was other, uh, a huge amount of publicity surrounding that. Um, and a Brief History of Time, the movie came out in 1990. At the same time, he separated from his wife, Jane. Hawking himself believed that his meteoric rise was due to a large extent to his ALS. As he said regarding the Lucasian Fellowship, 
Uh, I think I was appointed as a stopgap to fill the chair as someone whose work would not disgrace the standards expected of the Lucasian chair. But I think they thought I wouldn't live very long. And then they could choose again, by which time they could find a more suitable candidate. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint the electors. I think this is one of the most tragic things he's ever said. Um, because and there really isn't much of a question that he deserved that chair. An idea that he was given this award because he would die soon entirely diminishes uh, his achievements and his awards. And he constantly did this to himself. He was always second guessing himself. Um, and to be fair, there was some truth to it in certain cases. Uh, his election to the Royal Society at the age of 32, which was not like this headline said of the youngest ever, there were others who were younger, but it, his real young election to the Royal Society was in fact in part due to his disease. Um, but it was his book that got him fame. Um, it's hard to see, uh, though, whether it's actually his uh, what's actually his writing and what are other people's writing. So here's a first draft, and uh, I won't go into it here, but it really, if you read it, uh, it sounds uh, very much kind of like a bad college essay. Um, it's, it's just not very compelling. And here is a draft circa 1986 after his students worked on it. Um, and this is actually, it's close to the final version. It's very compelling. It's the, the idea of an old lady saying tortoises all the way down. Um, it turns out that the final version looks very much like a 1975 Reader's Digest article. However, that's uh, another issue. Um, authorship aside, though, uh, there was the immediate question about whether his publishers were exploiting Hawking's disability uh, to sell books. Uh, this was from a, um, a, a article in New York Magazine about the time that uh, Professor Time was really on the bestseller list. And um, it was rather really brutal. Uh, this is an almost unprecedented exploitation of a nonfiction author. I defy Bantam to name another nonfiction book in America. Any nonfiction book, other than an autobiography or biography, with a picture of its author on the front cover. Even Carl Sagan, whose books on cosmology and the universe, and whose wide TV exposure have made him a widely recognized face, has never had his own photograph on the front of a book. And that is true. That is absolutely true. His editor strongly disputes it. Um, uh, his editor actually uh, had polio as a child and lost his ability to walk for a time. And he still has actually some neural damage from polio. And he, he very much says that um, this was no exploitation. Wouldn't someone have to suffer for it to be exploitation? The most telling comment about the use of his disability to sell books uh, comes from a friend of his at Cambridge University, Simon Mitten, uh, who was... Um, worked with him at the, uh, Royal, uh, the, the um, uh, Department of Astrophysics at Cambridge, and then wound up being a, a publisher who bid for uh, a brief history of time. According to Midden, um, he, when he got the, um, the uh, offer from Bantam, Mitten took him aside and said, do be careful if you're dealing with those people, Stephen. Do ensure you're quite certain that if the aim is to make money and sell lots and lots of books, you don't mind the marketing techniques. What do you mean, Hawking had asked? Well, I wouldn't put it past them to market it as aren't cripples marvelous. You've got to go into it with your eyes open if you don't mind that approach, okay? And Mitten used that word, cripples, with the full intent to have that impact because of the, the pejorative nature of what he thought Bantam was going to be doing, that they were going to be putting his disability on display rather than the physicist he wanted to uh, showcase. Um, and I believe Mitten, I, I think he's right. I think Hawking made this deal knowingly. For him, I think it was something of a Faustian bargain. The fame cost him quite a bit, uh, and not just the fact that his disability overshadowed him as a human being but it cost him in some sense, his family, um, which I go to a bit in the book. Um, the third great irony of Hawking's life 
is that he was celebrated as a lone genius that outshone his colleagues when in fact uh, he his work was very much collective um, and very much depended upon some of his colleagues and he never really worked on a theory of everything so a quick timeline here um, his big insight came in 1974. He started working on singularities, which he first applied to the um, Big Bang, uh, using the, the work of Roger Penrose, uh, who actually won the Nobel Prize for Physics very recently. Um, 1974, what was really his signal achievement was figuring out that uh, black holes, in fact, radiate. Uh, radiation of a certain type instead of being completely quiescent and sucking everything in. Um, so, and I go into physics in the book as well, but this also depended very much upon Penrose, uh, Bekenstein, a bunch of other physicists' work was very important to his contribution. I'm not saying his contributions were not important and they absolutely were. He was again, a top flight physicist who made some very important discoveries. Um, but the theory of everything is not on here. But why is he associated with the theory of everything? And um, so uh, uh, again, he, he's not on the track. Um, he had, this is what he worked on, singularity theorem, uh, work on slow roll inflation, the no boundary theorem, uh, Hawking radiation, black hole entropy information paradox. Uh, but he's attached to the theory of everything because he, uh, worked at the interface between things that are very small, quantum mechanical, and things which are very large and high gravity, which is relativity. And when those things collide, you might get, uh, you need a better theory to fix the clash between these two. And so he was kind of at, in the area where the theory of everything uh, was being worked on, um, but he wound up uh, attaching himself to a theory that lost favor. Um, and when string theory came along, he didn't really participate. He poo pooed it, uh, partially because it, it was an American thing uh, that in, uh, the the, uh, the hotbeds of string theory were actually uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, Massachusetts, and California. Um, and Cambridge kind of looked at as, as, as being iffy. He did kind of join uh, the group later. Um, he also, interestingly, didn't believe in the Higgs boson in the ordinary sense. He, he believed that it couldn't be spotted. And he wagered a number of times uh, that it would not be spotted. He eventually lost that bet. Um, and towards the end of his life, I mean, part of the reason he was associated with the theory of everything is when people would talk about that. He, he, he was oracular and he was vague and he would talk about things that weren't directly in his area. And so he never kind of shot down the idea that he was the person, the go-to person on coming up with an overarching theory of everything that would reconcile quantum mechanics and relativity, even though he was not on the track. He had, uh, and the fact that he was seen as this lone genius, uh, despite the fact that in both of his main fields, there were lots and lots of competition, many of whom worked on the same things, had insights just as important, um, and were considered sometimes even stronger physicists. Um, here is a letter I dug up from an archive from a famed physicist, John Archibald Wheeler, uh, describing how he felt the field of general relativity stood in 1970. And um, he said, in every assessment of any, any scope, um, I continue to name as the six most promising people I know, Zeldovich of Mos Moscow, Misner of Maryland, Penrose of London, Carter of Cambridge, Thorne of Caltech, and Dirac of Texas. Hawking was not among them, even though uh, Wheeler was very well aware of Hawking's work and his ability. Um, so again, he is a top flight physicist, but in 1970, certainly he would not have been on the general relativists uh, top list of people. Uh, he was extremely strong, but um, he was not the best. Um, and Stephen was no doubt aware 
of this feeling and that people would pull strings for him because of his disability. I found this is actually a letter from Roger Penrose trying to get Hawking invited to a physics meeting uh, that he was not accepted to. It was kind of a competitive application. I was basically saying, if you don't invite him, now other people can go to other meetings. I'm unsure whether this would be likely to be the case with regard to Steve. And Penrose's uh, um, request actually prevailed. Uh, and Hawking did go to this meeting, which was important to his development. Um, so the biography I've written about it is about a man who's much more complex than his image. The real triumph of Hawking wasn't that he was the world's smartest man, but that he was a really important scientist and that he discovered something new multiple times that changed our understanding of the universe in important ways. And that is nothing to sneeze at. And the real tragedy of Hawking was not his struggle with his disease. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little harder to articulate the tragedy, but I like to tell a, an anecdote. Um, Hawking kept a poster of Marilyn Monroe on the wall. He was a big fan of Marilyn Monroe. Sometimes at his birthday parties, they'd have a Marilyn Monroe impersonator show up. He really did have this thing for Marilyn. And Errol Morris was filming uh, A Brief History of Time and a poster of Marilyn Monroe fell from the wall. And Morris turned to Hawking and asked him, I figured it out why you have all these pictures of Marilyn Monroe on the wall. Uh, like you, she was a person appreciated for her body and not necessarily her mind. And it gave me this really crazy look like, what the fuck are you saying, Mr. Morris? Gave me this crazy look. And then finally, there's a click. And he says, yes. Thank you. Okay, so now I can do some readings or I can take questions and answers or do it in whatever order you would like. I would love to hear a few passages from the book and then um, we have some questions, but just reminding everyone, if you have any additional ones that we don't end up getting to, uh, please add them to the chat. So yeah, Charles, take it away. Okay, thank you. So the first passage I've selected is um, when Hawking began his fame. He, pub he had just published uh, a brief history of time. And it was a runaway bestseller, and no one expected to, to do as well as it actually did. And um, this is kind of a passage from the moment it started taking off. And he is in the presence of a graduate student of his, uh, Ray Laflamme, who was there during some of his most important uh, times. Day after day, a brief history of time sold copy after copy. Not since Einstein had a theoretical physicist been the sort of person who would merit a profile in time on the cover of Newsweek, back in the days when those magazines were extremely influential. Nobody in the publishing world had seen lightning like this before. It was getting easier to mistake Hawking for God, or at least a rock star. In Chicago, two superfans, Susan Anderson and Bill Allen, printed 500 t-shirts bearing the words Stephen Hawking Fan Club, and they instantly sold out. So the pair printed more. Within two months, the number of shirts on the street had skyrocketed to 8,000, and they were appearing all over the city. Anderson and Allen started getting requests for shirts from all around the world, including from a certain physicist in Cambridge who wanted them in medium and large sizes. At the peak of the craze, one Chicago high school senior admitted that his t-shirt confused his classmates. Quote, my friends look at the shirt and ask, what rock group is this Hawking in, he told People Magazine. Worse, I have friends who claim they have his latest album. At first, Hawking couldn't quite fathom how famous his book had made him or what his fame would mean. According to Laflamme, the winter after A Brief History of Time first came out, Stephen decided to give a series of eight lectures to undergraduates at Cambridge based on the book, one lecture for each chapter. On the day of the first lecture, Laflamme picked Hawking up at the house but Hawking was in a rotten mood. Stephen was very unhappy and he was grumpy. 
everything I was doing was wrong. So I stopped and I said to Stephen, I don't put you the right way in the chair, or it's too late to go to the bathroom, or the tea is too hot or too cold. What's wrong? The flama calls. Peevishly, he looked at me and says, I'm worried about my lectures. I'm worried that no one will show up. Soon it was time to go. The two physicists made their way across campus to the lecture hall. You roll from the back door into the guts of the building, which doesn't have too many stairs. And we arrived in the room and it was packed. Packed with people, people sitting on the stairs, probably breaking all the rules for safety, says Laflamme. And suddenly Stephen has this big grin, that smile. That tells you that even he didn't expect to catch that fire. So I think I'll just read one more and a short one. Uh, this is just a, an anecdote from a reporter um, and a physicist who encountered him uh, at, uh, towards the end of his life. Hawking never expected to survive long enough to see any of his theories falsified. He had already outlived his doctor's dire predictions by an almost unbelievable margin. But as his students and collaborators were keenly aware, Hawking spent most of his years teetering on a stark boundary. His emaciated frame seemed too fragile to contain a life within. Yet despite the way his condition consumed his being, he was always stoic about it and even turned it into a source of fun. BBC reporter Paula Ghosh wrote about one encounter he had with a physicist in 2004. The camera operator I was with wanted to make a last minute adjustment to his lighting. And so we asked Professor Hawking's staff if he could pull out one of the plugs in the office so that he could use the socket for his equipment. Without waiting for a response, he pulled the plug and the room was filled with a deafening siren. Professor Hawking then slouched forward. And I feared that my colleague had inadvertently unplugged a vital piece of life support equipment. Fortunately, it was the alarm to the un uninterruptible power supply to his office computer. And he slouched forward with mirth at our incompetence. There was never a hint of self-pity and seldom any vulnerability, which made it all the more striking when it appeared. Neil Turok, uh, one of his colleagues, describes one time when he was visiting Hawking in the hospital after a serious operation to repair the physicist's trachea. One of the most moving moments I had with him was when his throat had collapsed. I went to see him in a hospital in London, Turok recalls. And the first thing he said to me was, I nearly died. And I just sort of sat there. Like, what do you say to someone who just told you that he nearly died? And so we sat there for a while and thought about that prospect. And then he said, let's discuss physics. Thank you. I guess I'll take questions now. OK. So we have some so really interesting. Click on them and take oh. them in order, or would you like to? Yeah, I can, I can ask them to you, Charles. So. Um, I'll do them in order. So the first one we have from the audience is, thank you for this eye-opening talk. You have done a wonderful job highlighting Hawking's deceit, but I'm curious about those of us who really craved his presence and his genius. Is there a facet of our culture that really wants to believe in singular, stoic, extraordinary geniuses like him? Yes, I think that's a very good point. I think that there is kind of a cultural need to create heroes of a certain sort. Um, and there are scientific heroes throughout history. Um, and they tend to cleave to a certain pattern. Um, they often wind up being um, otherworldly in some fashion. The, the first scientific hero that I can think of uh, is Thales. And he's described in the ancient Greek sources as being so absent-minded uh, that he uh, there was a story where he was looking at the stars and he was walking around and so was so entranced with the stars that he fell into a pit and a Thracian serving girl laughed at him, uh, which in the Greek hierarchy, kind of a, a slave, a Thracian slave was kind of the lowest of the low. So as genius as the person is, uh, there has to be some vulnerability associated with it for people to accept him or her as a hero. And I think that trope is very, very common. I think Hawking fit that very well. I think that part of the reason that he 
fit the psycho hero is because that disability made him non-threatening and made him otherworldly so that we didn't have to feel bad that we weren't as smart as he was because in his he sacrificed some of his humanity for that either it's, it's like Tiresias uh, you to become a uh, a seer you have to be blind and so I think that is a very important trope and so we create heroes that fit those tropes and I think that he was aware of that um, and so I, I and, and his stoicism also I, I do think that kind of um, La Flamme actually had a very bad case of cancer um, he he was uh, has uh, late stage um, lung cancer. He's, he's doing all right from what I understand. But he had a picture of Hawking on the wall. And he said, you know, if this guy can survive uh, with his disability, I can too. And so we do need these stoic figures and Hawking fulfilled that as well. He was incredible uh, when it came to his survival and the way he, he behaved in, in the circumstances he was in. I really liked that comparison to kind of Greek heroes or having that sort of vulnerability. Um, they have to give something up in order to have this special ability. Um, that's really interesting. We, we just had another question um, come in that says, could you talk a little bit about the experience of writing about the myth of a person? Do you feel like it brought you closer to finding the man underneath that myth or that spectacle? Absolutely. It, 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 this was really a, a, a an adventure of peeling away the legend and getting to the real the person you meet. And in fact, even though my biography is unflattering in many ways, it's it's, it's a warts and all biography. I f I'd like to think he would have appreciated it because it really does portray him as that human being with flaws uh, and myths. Celebrity. I mean, celebrity is myth making. And it is an image that is portrayed that is clean and um, devoid of nuance. When human beings are nuanced and difficult and have many pluses and minuses, that in fact, in some ways, the act of becoming a celebrity is washing yourself away from these nuances, uh, from these nuances. And then when a celebrity falls, those nuances come back. Um, so yeah, I think I think it really was a matter of piercing this myth. And it was very difficult. I, I didn't get cooperation from a lot of people because I mean it's it's hard to say bad things about a hero. And about a lot of uh, physicists actually really I mean really do look up to him and and, and I think I, I really appreciate it. I, 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 I mentioned this in, in my book that the the people who loved him and were still able to talk about him and his flaws, I, I, I have immense respect for because they were able to see that that was serving him um, in a way that I, I was unable to get uh, any interviews with any of the family or some of the people who are um, in that circle, including people that I've had 20 year relationships with that, that some sources that I've known for years and years and years and years and years would not speak to me at all about Hawking, um, which was really a shame because I, I, I do think he is a figure worthy of attention and worthy of being historicized, but turned into history. But I don't think that a legend should be turned into history. I think, I think that we, as a historian and a journalist, my duty is to really try to get at the truth, not necessarily that I'm able to do a perfect job, uh, but to get that nuance as opposed to uh, a lie over. Yeah, I want to come back to so there's a there's we have two questions left, and one of them I want to circle back to in closing. So I'm going to ask this other one and then come back to that. So uh, this one is the image of Hawking being at the center of world altering theories is such a powerful one, but you mentioned the work in actuality was the product of many different minds. Uh, so in your research, did you encounter any bitterness or resentment around this community of scientists who work with or surrounded him? Yes, but it was milder than one would expect. Um, 
I also think many, many famous scientists have the same experience. Yes. That's yes, not indeed. surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the person who had the greatest claim to being annoyed with him, <laughs> uh, Jacob Beckenstein, who was a uh, Israeli physicist who came ninety percent of the way towards um, Hawking's key discovery, and he was not really given much credit by Hawking. Uh, uh, but Beckenstein himself was—I mean, he said, "You know, I—I—I I, I was ninety percent of the way there. I didn't get there. Hawking got there, and the victor goes with spoils." I, I don't begrudge him this. And I, I think that's very generous of him. I, I, I've spoken to physicists who's, I mean, they make a Faust in bargain too, um, when they write a paper with Stephen Hawking, because they know that it's going to get a lot more citations and a lot more uh, attention than it, it gets, but they're only going to get a fraction of the, uh, the accolades when they come in. But one, one of them explicitly said to me, look, uh, I only get 1% of the, um, the uh, attention, uh, the, the credit that it's worth, but I get a thousand times the attention. So all in all, it works out better for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there was some resentment, there's some grumbling. Um, some people were annoyed that he would opine in areas that he was not an expert in and not necessarily being the right person to talk to the media about certain things. Um, and there were some kind of resentments around the edges, but generally speaking, I think um, I didn't sense any really bitter rivalries except for one or two. And that those stemmed from things that Hawking specifically did to them um, rather than anything having to do with his fame. It was a, 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 there were, one of the unflattering things about uh, Hawking was there, there were some elements of his personality where he would, um, he could hurt people uh, and he did it several times uh, and use his, his platform to do damage. Um, and um, that's where, where really uh, people did resent him. And so there are, there are some hurt feelings, but not because of his fame. So here's, here's where I want to end. Um, the question is, why do you think it's important to discuss the true nature of Hawking's myth or image? And I had the same question listening to your talk. I mean, I went into this talk of former former physics student, and he's an icon that many people hold up. Um, and what's so bad about that? I want to know, like, why you felt compelled to write this book. And like, um, I do like that you conclude with all of these still like things he should be celebrated for. Um, versus things maybe he shouldn't. So I don't know. I'd just love for you to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's similar to kind of the history of science because when, when we learn science, when we learn physics, uh, we have a sanitized version of the way people behave and the way people act with these, these ideas. Newton was sitting under the uh, apple tree and bang, all of a sudden you've got uh, calculus and universal gravitation. And it was... It's much more complicated than that. It's, this is not the way humans behave. And I think that to understand the way science really works, and science has flaws. Science is a human endeavor. Science is done by human beings. And when we depend upon science, when we believe in science, we are believing in this endeavor that is done by these flawed humans. And for us to project this superhuman ability on these scientists, you put on a white lab coat and you are infallible and you can um, pronounce from Mount Sinai and give people the cure for COVID or whatever. Um, I think that that leads to disappointment and distrust when our scientists don't live up to that image. And so I think it's very important to see science as science is truly done. And part of that endeavor is seeing scientists' flaws as well as their um, strengths. And to understand the fallibilities and the mental struggles and their blind spots, to see how science moves forward despite these flaws rather than 
kind of thinking of this as, as something that is inaccessible because you've got these people who are different out in the corner that do something that, that think differently from you and me, which is not the case. So for me, humanizing Hawking was not just a service. I, I, I do think it was a service to him because I do think he would, would have wanted it uh, that way. It's a service to his colleagues and to give credit to some of the colleagues who are kind of in the background. But it also shows the messiness behind some of these things that we take for granted now and don't think about how they came to be. And so uh, it's, it's, it's an origin story that demystifies not just Hawking, but science in general. I think you could extend that to a lot of heroes. Um, I would say, I think Gandhi might be a good example, obviously very different, but when you humanize people, then their accomplishments can, I don't know, become become maybe more tangible for the everyday person as well. I, I Maybe that's a silly conclusion to come to, but maybe that's what I think when you see like a, a God be brought down a little bit from their pedestal. You think like, okay, now that's tangible for me. Like they were a real person. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Hawking was, I mean, he was extraordinary. But he was, right. And what, I mean, that's expected. Yeah. Everyone's here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for indulging me in that question and all of these other great audience questions tonight. This was a terrific talk, Charles. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, we're coming up on the hour. I'll just close things out. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I've put links in the chat, but if you would like to learn more and read about this book, copies of Hawking Hawking are for sale on harvard.com via those links. Um, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great evening, keep reading and please be well everyone. Thank you.